Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the IDE Lunch Seminar. A tiny bit of housekeeping before we introduce our speaker. As is our custom, please turn off both your camera and your microphone during the talk uh, and ask your questions via the chat window. And if it turns out that there are clarifying questions that seem to be on everybody's mind, uh, Judy Chevalier, our speaker, has very kindly agreed to take them in stream. So if you could highlight if this is kind of a clarifying in stream question or not via chat, that would be great. Otherwise, ask your questions via chat. And at the end, our moderator will ask, will select questions. And at that point, you can either just have them asked via chat or at that point, if you want to unmute and fire up your camera and ask the, and ask the question via good old fashioned voice channel, that works too. But until the end, please no cameras, keep yourself on mute, and let's ask questions and interact via chat. Uh, I am really thrilled to have Judy Chevalier with us. She is a professor of finance and economics at the Yale School of Management. And I think the topic of this talk is fascinating. Um, we're going to hear about the demand for flexibility among gig economy workers. And if I'm reading the abstract correctly, focusing on Uber drivers. Uh, Judy, looking forward to it. Thank you for being with us and over to you. Great. Thanks so much. Um, I really appreciate your having me. Um, it's a uh... Uh, funny that after a year of scolding my students to keep our camera on, uh, that, uh, they, you know, it's just interesting that uh, different things, places do different things. Uh, and so I'm happy to, I have my chat open. If I'm missing your question, Andrew said he would interrupt me. An important question. Okay, great. So um, I'm going to give a little bit of overview on why I'm interested in gig work and digital platforms. I know that in this group, we have people who have done a lot of work in this area and know more than I do even. Even, but um, I'm going to give you my perspective and then talk about um, my recent, my most recent work on flexibility. Okay, so my plan for the talk is to talk more about why economists, in particular because I'm an economist, but really everyone should do more work on digital labor market platforms. And then I'm going to present my paper, Suppliers and Demanders of Flexibility, the Demographics of Gig Work. So, um, until recently, uh, there was a bit of a puzzle about how much gig work was taking place in the sense that, uh, especially digital platform work, in the sense that we all looked around and saw it taking place, and yet many of the household survey instruments that we use to um, monitor the uh, activities of workers in the economy were showing very little rise in independent contractor work. Um, uh, we now know from some recent tax data that, in fact, the share of the workforce with income from gig work has grown over the last, uh, say, 20 years, and in 2016 accounted for about 12% of the workforce. Now, obviously, online platform work is not the same thing as all gig work, um, but since 2011, according to the Kutzes paper, about uh, much, essentially all of the growth is from this growth in online platform work. And by 2016, about one percentage point of the workforce had income from an online platform. Um, and I think if we're thinking about from a, let's say, competition perspective, how competition for workers uh, has changed, uh, you might also want to throw in there other digital intermediaries, right? So this doesn't count the increasing role of digital intermediaries like LinkedIn or ZipRecruiter in matching workers and jobs. Uh, the role of kind of these matching functions has really increased um, over time. And I'm not sure we have a great measure of it. And I think, and I'll quickly argue that there are markets where digital intermediation has really not yet reached its potential. So I think people who are in the business of uh, looking at digital platforms, economists who have been working on digital platforms, uh, generally cite a reason for working on digital platforms is that they can work, they can provide a laboratory for examining characteristics of workers and labor markets that are often invisible. 
So for example, I'm gonna to talk today about how we can look at a worker's reservation wage um, and, and choice of hours and you know, very micro choice of hours. And those are things we can't observe in more traditional labor markets. And so one of the reasons to look at labor market platforms is that it provides a laboratory for um, examining those things. Maybe two years ago, if you had asked me why I'm doing work on digital platforms and labor markets and digital platforms, the, that's the answer I would have given for why I'm working on them. But now I really want to say that I think that we who are working on digital platforms should really kind of stop apologizing for working on digital platforms because they have grown, they are important. And as I've argued, there are lots of markets where there's opportunities for them to grow where we haven't seen them reach their full potential. So I think a second reason to be really interested in digital platforms is they are fundamentally changing competition for workers in the organization of work in a way that is only going to increase, uh, probably not decrease. Let me give a quick example of a market, um, not the talk, topic of my talk today, which I've been also working on, um, where it, it seems to be ripe for digital platformization and there's some nascent activity there. Um, I have a recent paper with Keith Chen and Elisa Long in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences using um, cell phone data to measure the movement of nurses uh, and nursing assistants across uh, nursing homes and, and relating that to the movement of COVID-19 across nursing homes. And one of the reasons we wrote this paper is because we discovered that most many nursing home workers, about half, are not employed by the nursing homes themselves, but are employed by agencies and moved around amongst nursing homes as the census at different nursing homes changes. And we can see why that has arisen. But right now, this is an industry mediated by um, a bunch of very old fashioned, very inefficient, very manual staffing agencies. And you can see that a situation in which your qualifications are all cleared, I mean, if workers can be moved across homes, which they apparently can, the market has shown, uh, once workers have shown their, their um, qualifications, have uh, interviewed perhaps a platform where they can match their shift in locational preferences to the shift in locational preferences of uh, uh, nursing homes certainly makes a lot of sense. Um, and in fact, we see that there are some nascent platforms for um, moving nurses uh, or allowing nurses to move flexibly. Um, and this one in particular is, is kind of a shift by shift type, um, type enter, uh, batching algorithm. So, um, you know, this is a market where right now you wouldn't think of it as a digital platform market, but we might wonder whether uh, digital platforms will take hold here because it seems to have kind of all of the appropriate characteristics. And I guess since I worked on COVID in this setting, you might now be thinking, well, I'm not sure we want even more movement across nursing homes. Uh, but I will say that um, these platforms, unlike the... Um, staffing agencies and the kind of uh, patchwork of dual job holding we see right now would probably have good records uh, of who went where in a way that would uh, make contact tracing a lot easier than what we see in the current nursing home setting where my colleagues and I had to um, resort to using cell phone data because there was no administrative data. So, um, I'm now going to turn to my very particular paper that I'm going to be talking about today um, with that introduction, but I just wanted to set the stage for why I'm interested um, in this kind of work and why, um, you know, if there are any graduate students on here, uh, you should be interested too. Um, so this paper is joint with my uh, friends at UCLA, Keith Chen and Peter Rossi, and also Lindsay Courier, who is now a, a graduate student at um, the Harvard Economics Department, but I put her former title on here that she was at Uber Technologies just in the interest of full disclosure. 
Um, so this paper has to do with demographics and flexibility. And I think we have heard uh, in some settings um, you know, various evidence about both women and flexibility and older workers and flexibility. Um, so in particular, there's a growing literature that suggests that some of the male female wage differential is due to differential willingness to supply on demand work. So for example, um, in the Bertrand et al paper, looking at law firms um, and other settings, there's um, a description of the possibility that one reason that women do not advance in law firms is because um, law firms have very unstable demand for the services of the lawyers. And you know, if there's a six week trial in Minneapolis, you know, they really want all hands on deck for that six week trial uh, in Minneapolis. And so that's a situation in which the work itself has a stochastic demand component and workers are, we think implicitly, maybe not always explicitly, but implicitly remunerated to providing or supplying flexibility uh, to the idiosyncratic demands of their employers. There's also evidence that suggests that women are more likely to demand flexibility from their employers. And this idea of a distinction between supplying flexibility to an employer and demanding it flexibility from an employer is something that we're going to be uh, exploring a little bit in this paper. And this stems from the fact that evidence suggests, uh, for example, from this Houghton paper, that um, you know, that paper looks at tech workers in Seattle. So, you know, the normal job day, right? So the it's not about the employer demanding substantial flexibility such as atypical work hours. It's about how on snow days in the Seattle public schools, uh, women workers are much more likely to call out uh, from their employers and take the day off than are men. Right. So that's a circumstance in which, you know, the men are essentially more predictable for their regular work than the women are um, and women are demanding flexibility. Of course, we know when we think about women in flexibility that that there's substantial evidence growing now that pandemic child care disruptions have disproportionately impacted women's labor, particularly women of color. Um, I also want to say a little bit about older workers. Um, there is an interesting literature on older workers. Um, Catherine Abraham has done a substantial amount of work looking at older workers. Um, and what they dem what Ka Catherine Abraham and various co-authors demonstrate is that older workers are more likely to undertake contract work, but this is concentrated in more highly educated older workers. So one thing we see among older workers, um, especially people nearing conventional retirement age, even past conventional retirement age, is people who have um, intermittent 1099 income from, for example, their for former employers. And we tend to see that um, somewhat among high income workers, uh, high income, high education workers, but much less among lower income, lower education workers. And there's some substantial survey evidence that suggests that older workers would work longer if more flexible jobs were available. And that this issue of the dearth of flexible jobs is particularly acute for low education workers, right? So we have many literatures in economics about consumption smoothing, how we want to save money and uh, smooth our consumption over the life cycle, it shouldn't be surprising that people also would have a taste for effort or, or labor smoothing. That, you know, I might, I, I, the normal retirement practice is to work 40 hours a week until you're, you know, 65 or 70 and then work zero. You know, some people might really prefer to work 20 uh, for the period from, you know, age 60 to age 80 instead. Um, and so um, there is substantial survey evidence, but not much outside of the survey to, to show us, you know, the taste of older workers for more flexible work.
Um, so this is where we enter uh, the usefulness of looking at gig economy platforms and in particular Uber. Um, so Uber is an interesting setting in which it provides at will labor relationships. So workers sign up for the platform, their license is checked, their car is checked, and then they are allowed to um, either supply work or never supply work as they see fit, when they see fit. Um, and so they have absolute flexibility over when to provide work. Um, however, workers certainly do supply work in response to the demand on the platform, right? So just like our lawyer's uh, work is really valued and really remunerated during the trial in Minneapolis, so, uh, on Uber, there are periods when demand is high. Uh, and so a worker will create value for Uber and Uber customers by providing labor exactly at those moments when there's high driver utilization and potentially surge pricing. Um, so we can think of Uber being a situation in which, uh, like the law firm, the demand is variable and workers who provide uh, services during the period when demand is particularly high and perhaps the number of drivers is low are particularly valuable for the platform and for the customers. And a nice feature about Uber relative to the law firm is that remuneration is mechanically higher when utilization demand is high relative to the number of drivers, right? So Uber, you're gonna make more on Uber if you're not sitting around waiting for a fare. So whenever utilization is high, remuneration is high. And so we can think about the question of which workers pursue these remunerative high demand opportunities, supplying flexibility to the platform at the moment when it's most valued. And you can again, think about the analogy to the law firm, even though let me concede, these are very different workers. We're also thinking about the idea that at Uber, workers can demand flexibility. So workers typically work on their own schedules and they consumer demand flexibility by working only when their reservation wage is low. And they often work gig work around other economic activities. So I might work at a McDonald's and when I have a shift, I don't drive Uber. And when I don't have a shift, I do drive Uber. Um, let me, uh, clarify my use of the term reservation wage, because I think not everybody, it's a term that economists throw out around, and it's maybe not a term that everybody uses um, in their work. Um, reservation wage is a term that economists use to denote the minimum uh, remuneration I require in order to supply labor. And so typically, I would say historically, when we talk about reservation wage, we might think of about a person having a reservation wage. So I, Judy, require, you know, $500 uh, to, to do consulting, whereas, you know, somebody else might require a thousand, just as an example. So we usually often think of a person as having a reservation wage. Um, in a prior paper um, that was published in the Journal of Political Economy with um, an overlapping set of these co-authors, uh, we talk about the idea of time variation in the reservation wage. Uh, time variation in the reservation wage is the idea that I might demand higher compensation to work in some hours versus others, right? So right now, it would really be rude for me to abandon this uh, webinar and go drive uh, Uber, even if the wages are super high, right? So I have a high reservation wage from Uber's perspective right now, because you know it would take a lot to get me to abandon this webinar and go uh, drive for Uber. However, there might be another hour in my life in which I have a lot of leisure, in which my reservation wage is quite low. And what we um, talk about in our prior paper and what we're gonna be exploring in this paper is the idea that time variation in the reservation wage is a way to conceptualize and model demand for flexibility. So the idea is that um, 
if my reservation wage was just constant, I could just work any hours the employer liked, probably the most remunerative ones, and then, you know, until I'm tired. Um, but if my reservation wage is time varying, so some hours are really costly for me to work and some hours less so, I, am dem I have a taste for flexibility. I want the job to be more flexible the more variable my reservation wage is. And so this idea of demand for flexibility by the employer that workers supply and demand for some flexibility by the workers uh, is what we're gonna be looking at demographically on the Uber platform. Who supplies uh, flexibility to the Uber platform and who demands it? Okay, and again, what's nice about the Uber platform is this is a setting in which, unlike the law firm, <laughs> the remuneration for providing flexibility and the willingness to pay to receive it are at least, with a lot of econometric lifting, observable. Okay, so let me describe our approach in this project. First, we're gonna be thinking about supplying flexibility as measured straightforwardly as the propensity to work when Uber payouts are high, right? So if I uh, tend to work when Uber payouts are high and John Horton tends to work when Uber payouts are low, I'm going to say that I'm supplying more valued flexibility to the Uber platform. I'm also going to get remunerated more because payouts are high when utilization is high. When we look at this, I'm also going to uh, kind of uh, subdivide uh, payouts from Uber into hours that are usually high and hours that are idiosyncratically high. So it turns out in the before times, before the pandemic, I'm not sure what it looks like now, in most cities, Monday 5 a.m. was a very lucrative time to drive Uber. And that's because lots of folks were going to the airport and not lots of drivers were driving. Um, and so Monday 5 a.m. is what we're gonna think of as a usually high wage hour. But we're also gonna think about idiosyncratically high hours, right? Um, so uh, it may be that Saturday four o'clock is not a particularly um, uh, typically high wage hour on Uber, but you know, if there's a Beyonce concert across town that starts at five, I don't know that Beyonce concerts start at five, but were there one across town that starts at five, that would be an idiosyncratically high hour. And some drivers might make an effort to chase that and some drivers may not. And we're gonna be thinking about supplying flexibility during the regular high hours and the idiosyncratically high hours and think about different demographics in their uh, willingness to do that. Um, we're also gonna be thinking about this demand for flexibility building on the work in Chen Chevalier, Rossi and Olson, um, which is our JPE paper published in 2019. And there we don't have any demographic data, but we think we build up this idea that I've already alluded to, which is that the demand for or value of flexibility is equated with time variation in the reservation wage for the individual. And we're going to be thinking about flexibility there as both the ability to set a customized schedule, as well as our focus in this paper, which is the ability to adapt to unpredictable or very high frequency changes in the reservation wage. So shocks to my availability. I'm going to use data on 200,000 Uber drivers in dense Uber cities to measure this question of both supplying and demanding flexibility. I'm going to relate it to demographics. Um, okay, so quickly, just what I'm going to be doing going forward. Um, I'm going to be talking quickly about the data. I'm going to give you a few fun facts about labor supply by demographic group. I'm going to talk about the suppliers of flexibility quickly review our, give it the highest level review of our model of demand for flexibility. And then I'll give some results on driver surplus and constraints of flexibility and sum up. Okay, so let me tell you briefly about the data. 
And let me say, I could take the whole hour on this topic. And so I am going to be parsimonious here. What we start with, and it's the same data set we use in our prior paper, is all driver hours from September 2015 to April 2016 on Uber X in the densest US cities for Uber. And these data um, are the same as the ones as we use in our other paper. And these are kind of raw data on, um, you know, John Horton uh, started turned on his app at 250, he picked up a customer at 310, he dropped off the customer at 330, uh, he turned off his app at 345, right? So it's a very kind of raw data on driver trips and payouts. And we decided to conceptualize this data to make it manageable by dividing time into discrete hours. So we define a driver as supplying labor if, it's, if the driver is active for 10 minutes in an hour, what does that mean? They actually have to have a passenger for some moment for 10 minutes or, or be driving to a passenger within an hour. And if they are, we're gonna code that as an hour in which the driver is working. So our goal is to get a vector of a, of, for each week, for each driver, 168 zeros and ones. So each hour is a yes, no. We're, we're collapsing all of the complicated things about what, what uh, a driver might have done into a yes, no. And then we're going to calculate a wage for a city hour. And the wage is going to be taking the payouts per minute, right? So if you worked 10 minutes, uh, and you made $5, you know, it's 50 cents. I'm gonna take the payouts per minute and then I'm gonna treat it as if one worked for the whole hour, okay? And so um, that, but I'm gonna do something, you know, it's a little bit complicated, but I'm gonna incorporate waiting time in figuring the wage because the waiting time um, is of course diminishing you know, if I have to wait around for passengers, that's diminishing my hourly wage. And I'm gonna take that into account when I'm calculating the wage. Now, okay, so I have all these zeros and ones for each driver and I have all these wage hourly wait, sort of pseudo hourly wages for each driver. I'm now going to be forever after in this talk using the average for all drivers in the city. So that means October 7th, 2015 at 12, uh, at 12, for the 12 to 1 p.m. in Boston, I'm gonna take the average wage for all of the drivers who worked that hour in Boston. And I'm gonna say, that's the available wage that a driver's thinking about when they're making a decision of whether or not to work. So I am assuming, um, and this is a whole topic for another day, uh, that drivers have a perfect forecast of the city conditions for any hour that they could work, uh, but not their own idiosyncratic conditions. So I'm kind of smushing across all drivers uh, in, the, in the city. Okay, and that's probably controversial, but um, uh, you guys are confined to the chat. So you can, we can talk about that later. Okay, so then we are gonna estimate parameters for each driver. And in order to do that, we're gonna create a sample of drivers who are active at least one hour in at least 16 of our 36 weeks. And we're gonna call this active drivers and we have about 200,000 of them. Let me just say that is a real choice. Like that's a filter which um, filters out a bunch of drivers because a lot of drivers who start on the platform are not working on it um, some months later. So drivers who keep working are a very particular subset and I, I don't wanna pretend otherwise. Okay, so we also are going to match this up to data on demographics. I'm gonna today mostly focus on age and gender as I did in my um, introduction. Um, though in the paper, we do have a lot of interesting issues about demographics of other types. Here in the um, paper, I'm most in the, in the talk, I'm mostly going to talk about other characteristics as characteristics I control for. And what are those characteristics? Well, we don't have driver income, uh, you know, other household income of the driver, but a proxy for that that we're going to be using is 
uh, an income based on the census tract in which the driver lives. And that was extracted for us uh, by Uber. And then Uber also doesn't have records of race and ethnicity. And that is something we would like to look at. And so we use a procedure um, which is an imperfect procedure, um, but that has been used before in the literature to try to get an estimate of the race and ethnicity of the driver. And essentially, you can think of what we're doing here is um, choosing the element of white, black, Hispanic, or Asian that is the highest probability given the driver's first name, last name, and census tract. So we're relying on other databases that match first name and first names and last names to uh, racial and ethnic probabilities, as well as census tracts, and using that to kind of draw uh, an estimate of the driver's uh, race or ethnicity. There are lots of limitations on this methodology. In particular, the four categories are treated as mutually exclusive in a way that they obviously aren't in the world. Um, but it'll give us some benchmarks about race and ethnicity. Due to missing data, um, we have about, uh, we have 178,000 drivers that we'll be working with. Okay. Uh, and let me say this is before Uber was tipping, just because I see there's some dis, uh, chit chat about that in the, in the chat. Okay, um, so a little bit about demographic groups and labor supply patterns of demographic groups. Um, one thing that you probably already guessed if you've ever taken an Uber is that there are fewer women drivers than male drivers by kind of a lot. Um, though about 2% of New York City taxi drivers are women. So uh, just to kind of put this in context, uh, Uber driving is much more popular among women than is taxi driving. Um, women represent a higher fraction of the under 60 drivers. Um, you'll, you can see that uh, there are the uh, age demographics of the drivers actually pretty closely match the age demographics uh, of the population um, until you get up to like about 80. Um, and of course, uh, you have to be 21. Um, the racial makeup of drivers, according to our estimates, is a little less white than the metropolitan areas that we're studying. Um, but I think, uh, uh, yes, a little less white than the metropolitan areas that we're studying. Um, also, maybe some uh, interesting point here about income quintiles. Uh, Actually, the income quintiles are the cutoff quintiles within the driver population is surprisingly similar, but not surprisingly, a little bit lower than the overall income quintiles in the metropolitan areas that we're using for study, which is to say you might be surprised that, you know, a fifth of drivers come from census tracts where the mean income is $116,000. Also, I think an interesting issue here, and one of the reasons we're gonna control for income in, in race is that women from lower income census tracts are much more likely to drive for Uber than women from higher income census tracts. Okay, that's obviously true in absolute terms, but it's also true as a share of all Uber drivers from those tracks. So the percent women is decreasing um, as you move to wealthier census tracts. Um, and I think I didn't mention this, but I should have. Um, uh, I should have also mentioned that across racial groups, um, the propensity, the share of dry black drivers who are women is much larger than the share of drivers who are women from the other racial and ethnic groups for which we have data. So one of the you know, reasons to have these income and racial data is they're interesting in and of themselves, but also because we have these differences, when I'm thinking about differences between men and women, I might want to and often will control for race and income. Okay, so uh, let me give you a couple of other little summary statistics. Um, so women tend to work shorter hours, fewer hours on Uber, 
than men. And you might think, well, of course, that's true in a lot of data sets about labor that women work fewer hours than men. But let me say, I don't think it's ex ante obvious that this would be true in Uber. Um, remember, Uber drivers work Uber around other economic activities. It's, a, it's for many people a side job. Um, you can see the vast major, majority of people work less than 40 hours in a typical week on Uber. And so I don't think it's at all obvious to me whether women would have ended up working less or more. Turns out they work less. Um, we can also see that older workers, these old over 60s, actually do disproportionately supply lots of hours to Uber. So the younger workers are probably more likely using it in a very secondary way. Older workers um, actually are tending to supply more hours. And that's going to play a role um, in what we show later. One more fact without any apparatus, um, and then I'll briefly turn to the apparatus. Um, so you know, basically what we're doing is going to be building in some part on predictability. And so a question you might ask is, for a driver that worked a particular three-hour block on Wednesday of the week of October 7th, what is the probability that that drive will, will work in the same three-hour block on Wednesday the following week? And it turns out for men, that's about 53%. For women, that's about 45%, right? So the labor of men is more predictable than the labor of women. And the labor of the over 60s is much more predictable than the labor of the under 60s. And that's gonna drive a little bit of what we find. Okay, so I'm gonna talk briefly about suppliers of flexibility. There is some apparatus here. Uh, let me describe it uh, in words, right? So if I think about, again, this average wage in a local area, I can think about the, 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 the um, I can think about the, the sort of uh, pseudo remuneration that a driver worked by thinking about each hour as this zero one supply and adding up the prevailing wage in the city for that hour. And that's going to tell me this kind of pseudo total wage for this driver, right? So it's going to tell me if the driver worked each, the entirety of each hour that the driver worked and um, earned the prevailing wage, this is the wage this driver would have earned in this week in this city. Okay, and so that's what I'm going to call the total wage. And then what I'm going to do for each driver is compare that to something I call the potential wage. And the potential wage is suppose that driver, um, you know, let's say John Horton drove 12 hours uh, in a particular week. I'm going to think about the potential wage as suppose John Horton had continued to work 12 hours in that week, but had successfully picked off the highest 12 hours of wages. So not even forcing them to be continuous or anything, but just if John Horton had succeeded in picking out the 12 most remunerative hours in that particular week, um, what wage would John Horton have earned? So holding the number of hours fixed. Um, and we're going to calculate for different drivers the share of that potential wage that they earn and, and consider it as an average across all weeks in the sample. And then I'm also going to decompose the hours. Uh, I'm going to de decompose the potential wage into the idiosyncratic piece and the expected piece. So I'm going to be thinking about replacing the wage when I think about the potential wage with the mean wage that hour earns across all of the weeks of the sample. So I can think about that Monday 5 a.m. is a kind of expected high wage hour. And then I'm gonna also think about the idiosyncratic wage, which is the deviation. You know, the Beyonce concert is a high deviation hour. And I'm gonna look at different drivers in their ability or willingness to capture high expected wage and high idiosyncratic wage. Okay, so finally, we're uh, ready for some results. Um, and so in the area of supply of flexibility, what we find is that the, um, the differences are actually fairly modest. 
It is true that if I compare, and this is younger women and men, uh, that women capture a little lower share of overall expected uh, possible wage than men do. Um, but the effects are pretty modest, so about two percentage points. So on average, men capture about 74% of the uh, total possible wage, women uh, 71%. And in when I think about just this idiosyncratic piece, it's about a percentage point difference. So there's a difference there, but it's modest. The age effects are also modest. And this remains too true when I do a regression uh, controlling for income and race. So I'll refer you to the paper for that, but roughly, you know, women earn, you know, maybe two and a half percentage points less of the percentage uh, potential wage, about one percentage point less of the um, idiosyncratic piece. And the age effects are kind of mixed and overall fairly small, even though they're statistically significant. There are also some interesting income patterns like the low income folks have a particularly high coefficient on capturing idiosyncratic wage. Okay, now I wanna briefly in the last, I think I have nine minutes until I go to questions, um, talk about something which is actually kind of complicated, but I'll try to give you an intuition, our model of demand for flexibility. So that's the piece about supply of flexibility. Uber has uh, varying opportunities. Who goes out and gets it? Uh, you know, some modest differences, but men more than women. Now I'm going to turn to demand for flexibility. And here I think the differences across demographics are somewhat more uh, less muted. Um, so how do we do this? Well, I talked about this idea of the reservation wage. And in our prior paper, when we didn't have demographic data, uh, we looked at this question of reservation wage by trying to back it out from the patterns of when a driver works and doesn't work. And so I'm gonna kind of give you an intuition for this. We observe when a driver works and when a driver doesn't work, okay? So let's suppose that um, John Horton works an hour with an expected wage of $15. We see him do that. That's in the data. Um, but then we also see that he doesn't work an hour with an expected wage of $20. Well, we have to figure that if he picked the $15 hour and he didn't pick the $20 hour, something is different uh, about those hours. And we are going to say that's the driver's reservation wage. Okay. So we're going to call that the driver's reservation wage. It could be due to their other economic opportunities. It could be due to, you know, their taste for being up late at night. It could be due to concerns and safety, but the driver's reservation wage is different if they take one of these opportunities and if they don't, okay? And so um, that, if I look at the pattern of when a driver works, I can then actually start doing things like decomposing that hour. Right, so if you looked at my pattern of uh, supplying labor, I might normally on Thursdays at the noon hour be driving Ubers, right? So I might be estimated to have a usual reservation wage for the middle of Wednesdays that's quite low. Um, but this Wednesday, even if there's a lot of money out there to be made in New Haven driving Uber, I'm not doing it because I'm here with you. And so my reservation wage uh, must have a shock. So we decompose individual driver's reservation wage into a mean for a particular time of week and shocks. Now I've kind of described this as if we have 168 you know, hours of the week to capture a mean. That's asking a lot of our data. So we are lumping the data into sort of reasonable groups in order to have reservation wages for blocks of hours. So then once I know your reservation wage and once I know the actual wage, I can calculate your surplus, right? So if I had a reservation wage of $20 and I drove in an hour when the wage was $30, I got $10 worth of surplus, right? So we're gonna calculate surplus. And then we're gonna think about this idea of 
once I know all this stuff about the reservation wage, I can counterfactually think about alternative employment scenarios where the individual driver can't respond to hour by hour dif differences in the dif reservation wage. In other words, if you estimate that, if I estimate that I, a driver, have a very variable reservation wage, because my hours are really hard to predict, then it's going, my surplus is going to fall a lot if I'm forced to ignore the use only my mean coefficients for the reservation wage in choosing hours. If you shut down my ability to respond to shocks, I'm going to lose a lot of surplus. So what, would, what we're going to be focusing on in this paper is who loses, who is it that loses this surplus in a less flexible scenario and what are their demographics? Okay, so uh, for the for the economists here, one way to think about that what we're doing here is kind of a multivariable probit, multivariate probit with a varying censoring point and a coefficient restriction. We're seeing whether or not you work, we're seeing it over time, we're seeing it for different wages, and that's identifying your parameters. So again, a mean and a shock. And we're also going to do this one thing. So this is, sorry, W star is the reservation wage. I'm rushing a little. Um, we have a mean for different time periods and a shock. In the paper, what we do is we decompose the shocks into shocks of a weekly frequency, a daily frequency, and an hourly frequency. And an hourly frequency, the idea here loosely is you know, if I don't work an entire day, I might tend un unexpectedly, you might tend to attribute that to the daily shock because I see it in a lot of adjacent hours. But if I only just don't work one hour that I usually work, I'm going to call that an hourly shock. Okay, so we decompose shocks. Let me give you a quick picture here of our of some parameter estimates. So this is Friday to Saturday late night on the y-axis and Monday to Friday afternoon on the y-axis. And this is relative to your mean reservation wage, how much reservation wage do you have at this hour, right? So if you have a high, if, you're, if you have a dot in this upper quadrant on any of these pictures, you are a person, and these dots are all of our data, uh, you are a person who demands a lot of compensation late night and uh, below zero, less than your average compensation in the, in the weekday afternoons. Why do these all look downward sloping? Because it tends to be that the folks who like to drive Friday and Saturday night, late night are not the folks who like to drive Monday and Friday afternoon. So even within demographics, these are downward sloping, but there are also interesting issues across demographics. So for example, if I compare women over 60, okay, they're not a lot of them. They also don't have a lot of mass in this quadrant. This is the quadrant that doesn't like weekday afternoons, but does like weekend late nights. Whereas males under 60 have a lot of mass in this quadrant, right? That means there's a lot of males under 60 who's who are revealed to us a low reservation wage Friday to Saturday late night, but a high reservation wage Monday to Friday afternoons. Okay, so let me give you some estimates of surplus. I've got, I'm gonna give, take about two more minutes. Um, so we're gonna be thinking about the expected surplus for each driver week. I told you how that worked. That's the difference between the remuneration in the market and what I've estimated your reservation wage to be uh, in expectation. And then the idea is that the driver should drive in all hours where the expected surplus is positive. I'm going to calculate that for each driver. That's the Bakes case. And then I'm going to be thinking about what happens if I don't allow the driver res to choose their hours based on their own shocks. So in a sense, I have to choose my hours not knowing my shocks, but when I, uh, but then my actual utility or surplus is based on the realization of my shocks. And I'm gonna focus here on the driver who can't adapt to these hourly reservation shocks. 
So I'm preserving the driver's ability to respond to wage movements on Uber, but I'm shutting down in this counterfactual the driver's ability to respond to shocks to their own reservation wage. So this is again, trying to track demand for flexibility. And what do we find? We find that, okay, the base flexibility varies somewhat across income groups. This is the weekly total surplus, sorry, the total surplus. In and of itself, our surplus measures are high. We're finding that about half of the wage earned is surplus. And yes, that's high. Um, and A here tells us what the surplus would be if we shut down ability to respond to your hourly shocks. And we estimate that Uber drivers have only about 41% of their total surplus preserved if they can't use Uber in this very flexible way, right? And so most drivers value flexibility a lot, okay? But what we see is there are actually pretty substantial differences across demographics. So women, of course, there are differences within demographics too. Uh, that's not shown here, but women um, value flexibility in the sense of what fraction of their surplus do they keep if Uber's less flexible. Uh, that's much smaller for women uh, than it is for men. And it's interestingly much bigger for older folks than it is for younger folks. We do some regressions with um, income and race, and those results are basically prefer, preserved. Older folks value the flexibility of Uber, so this is that surplus share. Uh, older folks keep more of their surplus when Uber, when they're not allowed to respond to their own shocks than do younger folks. And women lose about five percentage points of surplus relative to men, when Uber becomes less flexible. Okay, so what does this tell us? Well, were Uber to become more like a regular job, say in response to some regulation, the consequences would be very different for different demographic groups. We find that women are a little less responsive than men to the wage opportunities on Uber. They're a little less likely to supply flexibility in this way, chasing the Beyonce concert. Um, but a really bigger issue is that a greater fraction of women's Uber surplus would disappear if Uber were less flexible. Women demand flexibility from the platform. We see that. We see that overall, uh, older people have kind of a mixed and small response in terms of supplying flexibility, but they actually lose a lot less of their Uber surplus relative to young people if Uber were to be less flexible. And I think this actually does raise an interesting point relative to the literature I described earlier in that the literature tells us that survey data says that older people you know, really want more flexible opportunities and that they would work longer if, that exist, if those existed. And it's certainly true that you know, they value the flexibility of Uber. Their surplus drops if Uber becomes less flexible, but they value flexibility a lot less than younger people using Uber. And you know, probably when they answer a survey question about flexibility, they're probably thinking you know, that might mean part-time, that might not mean flexibility in exactly the same way that we mean flexibility when we're thinking about uh, women's taste for using Uber, being able to not use Uber intermittently um, when you know, something comes up in their life. Uh, and for race and income, we have fairly mixed results, uh, which we discuss a little bit more in the paper. So let me stop there because I ran over by a couple of minutes uh, and take some questions. Great. Thanks a lot, Judy. Uh, so the floor is now open for anybody to ask, uh, ask questions either through chat or through the microphone. Are there any takers? I have, I have a personal question actually for uh, the presentation if no one is uh, okay. has any burning questions. So my question is how, could you elaborate a little bit how exactly you uh, come up with a counterfactual in which you restrict the, um, the flexibility for women and, and men? Like how are you able to do that in the data? Okay, 
So what we do, um, and this, by the way, we do this in our prior paper before we had any data on demographics. And then we took that same data and once we got demographics, like projected it on demographics. So it's a little bit of a specification test that our uh, results made some sense. Um, so let me explain what we did. Okay, so first, you know, we estimate for each driver, um, you know, means for various time blocks and the variance of your shocks, right? And then we have that for each driver. And then we say that a driver, and, and we have estimated that by knowing that you will work if your expected surplus is positive and not work if your expected surplus is negative, right? That's, that's the censoring that makes us be able to, to estimate your reservation wage. Um, then once we have that, we have this kind of mapping of your preferences. And then I can say, Okay, suppose that Hong Yi had to choose his hours based on his mean parameters, but, but ignoring his variance parameters, right? He would choose those hours of driving whenever his reservation wage is positive, right? Um, and of course, here we're using the distribution, the expectation, right? Um, and then that means that then when I put his shocks back in, some of his surplus ex post turns out to be negative, right? And some of, and, and some hours when he would have had positive surplus, he actually didn't work, right? And so I'm gonna add that up and say, what is that surplus? And that surplus, uh, relative to the total surplus, you know, in the base case, tells me your counterfactual loss from from not having flexibility. Perfect. That makes a lot of sense. And then, as a follow up, is there any like sort of longer um, plan to study whether or not this surplus, this surplus that you guys measure, has like gone down over time? Because twenty fifteen, I guess maybe it was peak Uber surplus and then since then has gone down and maybe you know that's why there's, there's movement for like 85 being pushed to classify them as full-time employees and get more benefits because that's yeah. it's gone yeah i mean i think it's possible of course um because this was a period where they were trying to attract more drivers onto the platform things have certainly changed um that might be true um I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get, uh, it's a lot of work to enter into a data agreement with Uber, so I'm not sure I'm going to be personally able to do this, um, though, um, though that there, there are some people looking at different periods doing similar work from us building on this, um, so probably not. I mean, I will say in terms of the classification issue, um, I am fairly sure that the, you know, you may be right that the level of surplus has changed. Um, I mean, of course, as uh, I think there's some work, John Horton actually has some work, uh, you know, talking about the fact that given that there's endogenous entry, it's not obvious that the amount of surplus has changed, right? In that, in with free entry, there should be pushing, you know, the wages are going to, uh, you know, the wages are going to adjust to reflect uh, differences in say the rate of pay on the platform. So it's not 100% obvious that the surplus has fallen, um, but I would say the issues around, you know, what does this population's taste for flexibility look like? You know, I'm hopeful that that's relatively durable, but you know, science marches on, I'm not sure. Awesome. Let's see, I am not seeing any more chat question. Maybe I'm missing someone. Um, How you can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah go for it. Yeah, Jim. thanks, dude. That, that was great. Um, I'm glad that I was a, an example in, in, <laughs> in all of your earning scenarios. Um, one, this is uh, not directly related to what you talked about, but do you can you look at um, learning over time and do, do drivers get better at the kind of cherry picking the best? shifts for the best the best times yeah so we can look at that uh we haven't done that yet um i think the answer is they probably do right so we do um yeah we haven't looked at that you know there's a little bit of that in the rebecca diamond at all paper um and they do find a little bit a little bit of learning over time and you know let me say that sort of here we're kind of assuming everyone we are making a pretty strong assumption which is everyone could get the highest hours if they chose to get out of bed and get them 
but that's probably not, you know, that's probably not quite right. Um, and so I think learning on Uber is actually a really interesting issue. And I actually think an interesting issue for platform work in general, you thought more about this than I have, is probably makes, you know, it's, there's probably way more learning in taxi than there is in Uber because the app does so much for you, right? They tell you which turns to take, they're monitoring traffic, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's in the interest of the platform developer, I think, to kind of make learning more modest in some sense, right? And they do do things uh, at this time on Uber, like send out notifications, some of which are maybe not completely accurate, like, hey, there's a Beyonce come on, concert tomorrow, expect this kind of surge. So they have some interest to try to flatten that, I think, and they do some amount of stuff to try to flatten that, but yeah, they're surely learning. Great. Yeah, no, I, I kind of share that view that a lot of what the platforms are trying to do is make people more productive. And, you know, if there's tips that they can pass on or sort of use their kind of bird's eye view of the market to encourage certain behaviors, they, they tend to try to do that. Yeah, I agree. And the, yeah, so it's in their interest to do that, I think. There could also be like some kind of coordinated supply uh, withdrawal, right? Like people who just don't go on the app for a certain amount of times so that they can pump up the prices and then they they go back in to catch the premium so that's what i've heard like anecdotally of course in different not in the u.s context maybe in different countries have that. yeah i think it's pretty hard um i think it's pretty hard uh to to do that in a de in these cities these are dense cities but you know probably mm -hmm. in more sparse places for sure um so listen to raises the point and i tried to slightly allude to that but um but uh uh you know, maybe didn't get, gave it a little bit short shrift, which is, you know, when I'm thinking about your reservation wage, it's about your outside activities, but it is also presumably about what you think the nature of working Uber is like at a particular moment, right? And we actually spend a little time in the paper on uh, common supply shocks, like, um, you know, what happens if lots of Uber drivers are observed, are, are having a reservation wage uh, shock simultaneously. That's a little bit of a threat to our identification strategy. But I think, you know, yes, all we can do to, in answer to Lucinda's question is um, maintain, you know, treat my taste to not have drunk people in my car as part of my taste process. Like that's just one of my tastes just like one of my tastes is not getting up early in the morning. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Judy. Well, thank I, think so we've, much. I think we've pulled you over our, our usual time limit. Thanks very much for joining okay. us. It was a, a pleasure. And, and thanks for using John as the example. We have, uh, we'll, we'll be using John as our example in every seminar going forward. Um, so thanks everybody for joining us next week. Same time, same station as Sarah Banna, a longtime friend of the IDE now at Stanford. We're looking forward to uh, next week's seminar. Thanks, Judy, and we'll see the rest of you then. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.